and few there be that find it. You see, Jesus taught that few people would be saved and many would be lost. And yet, Titus chapter 2 verse 11 teaches that the grace of God is extended to all men. That makes clear there's something more to it than the grace of God. It demands a response upon our part. And that response is to believe in, to love, and to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, John chapter 14, verse 15, and verse 21. So God wants us all to be saved, but let us note that none of us can earn his salvation. No one, not one person, earns his salvation. Romans 11 and 6 declares that if it's by works, then it's not by grace, and if it's by grace, it's not by works. Now bear in mind that you must study carefully about that matter of works. There are works of merit, works whereby if you had done them, you could declare to God that uh, I have earned my salvation. The Bible makes clear that there really is a matter of fact, no such works extant. It's not by the works of the law of Moses. The law of Moses was done away, nailed to the cross. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 to 16, and Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. The Jews, the law of Moses was given to the Jews and only to the Jews. That law has been nailed to the cross, and now all men, all Jews and all Gentiles, are under the gospel. Jesus said, as recorded in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, to his disciples, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that disbelieveth shall be condemned. Now notice in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, salvation is a gift. For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. You cannot be saved apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. It is by his blood that we've been redeemed, Romans 5, 8 and 9. It is by his blood that we're justified, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. So then... For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is not anything that when we have done it, we can brag about it. Jesus taught in Luke 17 and 10, when you've done all you've been commanded to do, count yourselves as unprofitable servants. If God were to give me a hundred million acts of obedience to do within the next thousand years, and I had done them all, I could not say, then I have earned my salvation. It would only simply be that I have done that which it was my duty to do and my responsibility to do. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, notice carefully, the wages of sin is death. What we do earn is death by sin, but what we receive as a gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Look at this passage again. Turn in your own Bible and read it. For the wages, what you earn, for the wages of sin is death. But, notice the contrast, but the gift of God, that's the grace of God, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And do we have to obey? Of course we do. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, the Bible says of Christ, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became unto all them that obey him the author of eternal salvation. Of whom is the Lord the author of eternal salvation? Of those that disobey? No, of those that obey him. Let's notice this question, please. Does the fact that salvation is a gift mean that sinners have nothing to do to be saved? Let us see. My friends, I listen to radio, I listen to television, I read the newspaper, I read books and magazines, and I know that multiplied thousands of preachers tell people that since salvation is by the grace of God, they have nothing to do. There is nothing further from the truth. There is no one living on the top side of God's green earth today that could prove the Bible teaches that man has nothing to do to be saved. Well, one says, as soon as you believe, you're saved. No, we'll see that that isn't so. Let's look in ordinary affairs of life and we'll see that the fact that something is a gift doesn't always mean that we have nothing to do. Does the fact that something is a gift mean that the receiver of the gift has nothing, absolutely nothing to do in order to receive the gift? No, it does not. Let's look at some instances. All of us are familiar with these things. We know and understand them. You don't have to read the Bible to know that. Suppose I were to say, let's say there are three people standing out here and I hold up three $100 bills, and I said, I'm going to give these away. You don't have to do anything to earn it, but I'm going to make this statement. He that believeth and sticks out his hand shall receive 
I have $300 bills. There are three of you here. Each one of you then who obeys what I've said will receive it as a gift. You will not have earned it. You want to work for me. You wouldn't have earned it in any way. Now, suppose two of them stick out their hands and the other one doesn't. I would give $100 to each of the two that stuck out their hands because they had met the conditions that I had given them. The other man wouldn't receive anything. Well, did the other two do anything more to earn it than he did? No, they did not in any sense earn it. It was a gift, but I had made that gift conditional. My friends, the salvation that's offered to man through Christ is conditional. It's contingent. It depends upon our response. Titus 2.11 makes clear that God extends his grace to everybody. But Jesus made clear that many people would be lost and only few would be saved. Why is that? It's because the grace of God is contingent. It's conditional. You have to respond to the conditions that God has given. He's the author of eternal salvation to those that obey him. Let's notice what the Bible teaches. In the case of the Israelites in the Old Testament, they had come to the city of Jericho, going to the promised land. In Joshua chapter 6 and verse 2, God says, I have given unto thy hand Jericho. Of course, they didn't yet have it, but here was a prophetic perfect. God was speaking of the future as if it were already the past, but he knew it was going to give it to them upon the basis of their obedience. After he had said he'd given it to them, he'd made clear that it was a gift. It was by his grace. He then gave them instructions that involved no less than 15 acts of obedience. He told them to march around the city once each day for six days. That's six times. Then on the seventh day to march around seven times. Then to blow on the, on the ram's horn of the trumpet and then to shout. There's 13 acts of obedience. There's two more acts of obedience. And that's 15 altogether in order for them to receive the gift. And it was then and not until then that the walls of the city fell down. Notice in Hebrews 11 and 30 that the wall, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down. Notice carefully that it was by faith. By faith the walls of Jericho. Now, here were people acting by faith, but when did they receive the blessing that God had promised them? Notice this word after. After those that city had been compassed about seven days involving 15 acts of obedience. And yet I hear preachers on television and radio assuring their audiences that there is not one thing that they must do after having believed in Christ in order to be saved by the blood of Christ. Why they say that would nullify the grace of God. God gave these people this city. They didn't earn it at all. It was a matter of his grace. But it was after they had walked around that city uh, seven days and after they had been involved in 15 acts of obedience. Now, also in the case of the uh, brazen uh, serpent in the wilderness, in Numbers chapter 21, verses 6 to 7,